Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Hour of the Truth with Yerk Blissman and Tom Fress. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm standing in for Yerk this moment because he's preparing to read uh, what he promised to read last week on the broadcast, a communal prayer that was prayed by the first century Christians, those who lived uh, in the world uh, after Paul's decease, okay? And those who were informed by Paul who the Antichrist was going to be. And these same Christians understood what was withholding the rise of this Antichrist. And since the Antichrist would waste the saints and would be a nemesis of Christ, they prayed for the longevity of the Caesars. They prayed for the health, the wealth, and the prosperity of the Caesars because they knew when the Caesars were taken out of the way, that man of sin would be revealed, okay? This is to prove to the listeners what we've always maintained, that Paul told the Thessalonians to their face who this Antichrist would be, and that before his rise, the Caesars, the restrainers, must be taken out of the way. And this, this prayer, which is re recorded by Tertullian, uh, uh, a second century saint, one of the, the so-called fathers of the Christian church, a historian, records this prayer. And so now you know, when you, when you listen to and comprehend this prayer, they too knew that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Okay, now we'll read the prayer as promised by Yerk Glissman, the last broadcast. Thanks, Yerk. We offer prayer for the safety of our princes to the eternal, the true, the living God, whose favor, beyond all others, they must themselves desire. Thither we lift our eyes with hands outstretched because free from sin, with head uncovered, for we have nothing whereof to be ashamed. Finally, without a monitor, because it is from the heart we supplicate, and without ceasing for all our emperors we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire, with our hands thus stretched out and up to God, rend us with your iron claws, hang us up on crosses, wrap us in flames, take our heads from us with the sword, let loose the wild beasts upon us. The very attitude of a Christian praying is the preparation for all punishment. Let this, good rulers, be your work, Ring us from the soul, beseeching God on the Emperor's behalf. Upon the truth of God and devotion to his name, put the brand of crime. There is also another and a greater necessity for our offering prayer in behalf of the Emperor's, nay, for the complete stability of the Empire and for Roman interests in general. For we know that a mighty shock impending over the whole earth, in fact, the very end of all things, threatening dreadful woes, is only retarded by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to be overtaken by these dire events, and in praying that their coming may be delayed, we are lending our aid to Rome's duration. So there you have it. Direct from the earliest Christians written record of their communal prayer acknowledging that they know that which is going to replace the Caesars would be the greatest horror the church of God would ever know. And they prayed for the longevity, the health, the welfare of the Roman Caesars, the government of Rome, because after they are taken out of the way, then that man of sin will take power. This was recorded by Tertullian, a second century saint 
and historian. And it proves what we've always asserted, that the earliest Christians under Paul's ministry knew precisely who the Antichrist would be. Now you must ask yourself, why does not your pastor teach you these things? Is it not his responsibility? Because in teaching this, you have proof, historical proof, that the papacy is, was, and always will be that man of sin, that son of perdition, that counterfeit Christ, that nemesis of Christ, the one who thinks to change God's times and laws, the one who wears out the saints of the Most High, who is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, the one who rules over the kings of the earth and uses the kings of the earth to persecute the saints of the Most High, to soak the earth with the blood of the saints of the Most High. Those who know in their heart of hearts, number one, who is the Christ? And number two, who is the Antichrist? And they preached it from the rooftops. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. This was known from the earliest centuries after Paul's demise. Why are we ignorant today? Now, the author of the broadcast, Yerk Glissman. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for that wonderful introductory to the study today, which will be part two of what we did last time, meaning that we are going into this little website that I found by the grace of God, because, um, you know, I saw this years ago in a video, and then all of a sudden I came back when I talked about it, and I found it, and we were speaking about all the different uh, reformers that were mentioned here, like uh, Cotton Mather, John Wesley, John, uh, Thomas Kramer, Roger Williams, John Knox, John Calvin, Martin Luther, of course, all these people. And then we came to the point here in the end, which is about the Presbyterian Church, and we are speaking of the year 2000. So this is quite common. You know, when we spoke about all these reformers, we are speaking of people who have been dead for 400, 500 years, almost. And then you say, oh yeah, but they said that in the past, but now Rome has changed, the Roman Catholic Church has changed, everything has changed, everything is good now. I mean, uh, didn't the Pope come out in the year 2000 and say his quote-unquote mea culpa? According to many official sources, he did. Oh, I'm sorry what happened in the Inquisition. You know, today we have the 16th of February 2022. I was driving my cab this afternoon and I was listening to the news, as I always do when I drive a cab, I listen a little bit to the news because some people you need to be, uh, you need to quote unquote entertain that you are up to the news in the world, especially the news in Belgium. So I listened to that and the king of Belgium, uh, because Belgium is a kingdom, uh, and his wife are on some visits and it has to do with the Congo, with the Republic of Congo or, or Zaire or whatever you want to call it, you know, that country that uh, the Belgians uh, invaded, I call it, in the 19th century and made it their colony. And even in the 19... Now, don't nail me on the exact date. I think it was in the 1970s or 1980s. Um, the president of Congo was killed, called Lumumba. And uh, when you read the right sources, you understand that the Belgian government gave order to kill Lumumba. Um, that is of called what is called with the Jesuits regicide, yeah? kill a king. And the Belgians called during their um, oppression of the people in Congo, that is Black Africa for the people who do not know, uh, especially under King Leopold III, I think, they killed about 12 million people people, aborigines, meaning original inhabitants of that country, 
all black people. 12 million during the time of their bloody reign. They didn't just shoot them or something else. They used very often the same torture tools that you are familiar with when you watch some videos of the Inquisition in the time. They were tortured, persecuted and killed in uncountable numbers, but the numbers go up to about 12 million. Now, what I'm going to tell is, today in the news, there was that this Belgium king now today is probably there, and they spoke about what happened in the past and said, oh yeah, and the king expressed that he was very sorry. There had been made some mistakes in the future. If that doesn't make you barf, I don't know what. Some mistakes in the future? Well, that's about the same as Pope Antichrist, Pope John Paul II said in 2000, it was his mea culpa. And today the Roman Catholic Church completely denies that there was any, any, uh, ever any Inquisition anyway. Oh, here and there were a few people killed, but that's all. They deny that they killed at least 50 million people throughout the centuries, throughout Europe. As you can hear in the wonderful song that will play in the end of this broadcast again. And I just had to barf, almost, when I listened to that on the radio today. Oh yeah, some mistakes have been made. We are talking about 12 million people. This is double the homicide allegedly the Germans did with the Holocaust in the Second World War, with 6 million Jews. But they were just blacks in Congo, you know? And then a few years later, the Belgian king comes and says, oh, yeah, there had been some mistakes made. And what are they doing for reparations now? Oh, they are giving some artifacts, some artwork back to the Republic of Congo now. Yeah, we stole this and this is in our museum and hey, we're going to give it back to you. Isn't that nice of us? Doesn't that make us, doesn't that wash us free from the sin of killing 12 million of your wonderful people over there. You know, the problem is that people just forget during the time what happened in the past. The Holocaust of the Germans against the Jews in the Second World War is hammered to us in our brains every year again and again and again and again since the early 50s. Because in the end of the 1940s nobody knew there was a Holocaust. They all came just out in the 1950s. And since then, they are hammering it in again and again. But nobody is remembering these 12 million Congolese people. Nobody is remembering the 50 million at least saints, Protestants, Bible-believing Christians during the time of the Inquisition. And that just makes me sick. Now, the point why I'm all telling you this is when we go to the video, we know that the mentioned reformers here that we spoke of last week have all died in the meantime. And they're hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But now we go into something that is more um, up to date, let's say. Contemporary is, I think, the correct English word. We are speaking about the Presbyterian Church, and we are speaking about a Bible Presbyterian Church meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina on March 25th, 2000. There was made a resolution, and we are speaking about what the resolution is, but I cannot begin this without giving Tom a chance to add his five cents to what I just said in the inaugural broadcast. Please, Tom. Well, I, I think it's testimony to what the Bible literally acknowledges. The Bible says that, that uh, the saints perish and no one takes it to heart. Look at all who have died in this world at the hands of Rome and the kings over which Rome rules. The kings of the earth do the bidding of the Antichrist. They kill the saints of the Most High. And hundreds of millions of people have died believing in Christ and denouncing the papal antichrist. 
but no one takes it to heart. Why? Because they're never told. They don't know who the Antichrist is because they're never told. They don't know the sins of the Antichrist and how the papal Antichrist fulfills all the scriptures, all the prophecies in the Bible pointing toward the Antichrist. Nobody points out that the Pope of Rome is the one about whom Paul spoke to the Thessalonians in Thessalonians 2. No one is taught anymore who was restraining his rise to power. And no one is telling the saints what is clearly taught in the scriptures that that man of sin, that son of perdition, that papal antichrist must be revealed before Christ returns. They're all taught that Christ returns before the man of sin is revealed. That's just how screwed up the churches are. That's just how apostate the churches are. That's just how diabolical the, pap the, the pastors are. And they need to be fired forthwith. You need to take back your churches and start preaching the truth. You need to tell what your pastors have kept from you all your life. Vital truths that make all the difference. We just read the quotes from the list of so-called Protestant reformers, but just remember, these were in the 1500s. There have been those who knew about the papal antichrist all the way back to the second century, as we have previously proven by reading that communal prayer. God's people have always known who the antichrist is. Do you think the God of glory would keep from his saints that vital information, who the Antichrist is? Heaven forbid. Why, after sending his son to the cross to bleed and to die to redeem us from our sins, why, oh why, would that same merciful God hide from us the identity of the Antichrist? Would he not want us all to know and to know in such a degree that we could never forget? That's exactly what he did. He made it impossible for us not to know who the Antichrist is. That's the kind of care and loving, uh, loving precaution that you would give to any of your children. Or you would not be a worthy parent, would you? And so the early church knew who the Antichrist was going to be even before he reared his ugly papal head. They denounced him before he was ever born. They prayed against him while he was still just a concept. And when he materialized in the world in the form of the papacy after the Caesars were taken out of the way, They've denounced him all throughout history. And those who we listed, those who we read quotes for, were just simply Roman Catholics who came out of the Roman Catholic Church to denounce their own pope as the Antichrist. It was Roman Catholics who were mercifully saved by a loving, sacrificial God to know who the Antichrist was. First, they knew who Jesus Christ was, then they denounced the papal antichrist. But don't think that was the beginning of the truth. These were latecomers to the truth. We call them Protestant reformers, but they were latecomers to the truth. The truth was known by the Bible-believing saints all the way back to the second century as recorded by Tertullian. That's why the earth is soaked with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And when the saints perish, no one takes it to heart because your pastor doesn't tell you anything about any of this stuff.
and it's vitally important to your salvation. Otherwise, when Christ returns, he may find you bowing down and worshiping and obeying the man of sin in Rome. And that's exactly what your current pastors and priesters want. That's why they don't tell you these things. That's why they keep this from you. And they do it in the guise of trying to maintain unity? Are you kidding me? They don't want to be controversial. They don't want to stir up the church. They want to keep that tithe money coming in. They don't want anybody walking out of the church. They got shingles to pay for for the church. They've got new office buildings to build. They've got new employees, church organization. To, it, it's all cost money. It's expensive. You know what? You'd be better off praying and worshiping God out in the timber down by the river. At least you'd have a chance to hear the truth. And that's what we all need to do. Get out of the churches and do whatever we have to do to hear the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, do whatever we have to do to hear the truth, Tom. There's a very simple uh, medicine for that. It's called the King James Bible. Read the Bible, understand the Bible as it is written. Don't understand it as man tells you to understand it. But read the Bible and understand it as God wrote it and meant it to be understood. That's right. So, let's go into our little movie here. We have to go to this part of um, that I just announced. Uh, the following resolution was unanimously passed by the South Atlantic Presbytery of the Bible Presbyterian Church meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, on March 25th, 2000. So first we have had all these comments of all these old reformers and protestants, and now you're seeing what they said in the year 2000, contemporary. The threat of the Roman Catholic Church in the 21st century. Whereas the mass media has captivated the world with the activities of Pope John Paul II during his visit to the Holy Land in March 2000, and whereas the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation have signed in October, and I add 31st of October, Reformation Day by all days, 1999, a joint declaration of a court on the doctrine of justification. Only the synods of Wisconsin and Missouri dissented. Now, uh, allow me and Tom to uh, say a few words about this um, uh, yeah, declaration, they call it. I call it more a pact, you know, because it is the Lutheran World Federation that gave up their protest at that moment. They surrendered all their weapons, means their brains, yeah. They gave away their brains and they put in the place uh, perende ac cadaver to the Roman Catholic Church, means uh, obedience as a cadaver. They gave up what they stood for. They gave up um, what their founder, Luther, stood for in the Joint Declaration of 1999 on the Doctrine of Justification, on the Joint Doctrine of Justification. Tom and I made... <laughs> several, I think four or five broadcasts, because our wonderful now deceased brother in Christ, Richard Bennett, um, analyzed this paper and Tom and I read it and those were the very first broadcasts on Hour of the Truth, so you can find that on my channel when you go to the playlist Hour of the Truth and the very, very first few broadcasts deal with the reading and understanding that Richard Bennett put into us when he uh, analyzed that paper, the joint declaration of, just, uh, of the doctrine of justification between the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Worldwide Federation. A, if you ask me, complete surrender of the Lutheran World Federation to the whore in Rome. But of course, I'd like to hear Tom's comment on that. And he remembers the broadcast we did vividly, I guess. Well, yes, and we hit on some vital truths of the true biblical Christianity. And Martin Luther, 
this is this is history that your pastors should be teaching you. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk. Martin Luther was a devout Roman Catholic. And by reading the scriptures, which was forbidden to do, by the way, by reading the scriptures, Martin Luther miraculously came to the realization through the scriptures and the scriptures alone that we're not saved by the Pope. We're not saved by the priest. We're not saved by the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, the mass, holy matrimony, all the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, extreme unction, uh, participating in all the works of the Roman Catholic Church. No, we're not saved by any of that. We're saved by grace alone. Grace, the unmerited favor, the unearned favor of God. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. That is, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's what faith is. You believe what God says. Okay? So Martin Luther learned that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. So where's the need for a pope? Where's there a need for a Roman Catholic church? Where is there a need for sacraments? Where is there a need for priests? Where is there a need for monks? Where is there a need for nuns? Where is there a need for Mary and all the saints? There isn't one. All of a sudden, Martin Luther was freed from the Roman Catholic church and all of her false doctrines and all of her control, and all of her false pretenses, and all of her false signs and wonders, and all of her false eschatology, and all of her Roman Catholic canon law, and everything gone in an instant. And he was on his knees in prayer, thanking God for the unmerited favor of Almighty God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Martin Luther knew he was saved. He would not spend a day in purgatory, not a minute in purgatory, not a nanosecond in purgatory. All the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church were lies, and he knew it. And so he protested the papal church. He called it the synagogue of Satan, and that it is. And he came out of the Roman Catholic Church, just like the Scripture says, Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, so that you receive not also of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Martin Luther knew that the judgment of Almighty God was aimed directly at the Roman Catholic Church, and you wouldn't want to be within a country mile of any Roman Catholic Church when the judgment of Almighty God hits the earth. So Martin Luther came out, and so did many, many, many. And they became what we know today as Protestant, that is, Protestant reformers. They protested the man of sin, the son of perdition. They were absolutely right, and they got, they went about teaching the truth as best that they could know. Now, they weren't perfect, and we pointed out their errors over and over and over again. But it was a move out of the Roman Catholic Church on the road to perfection. Perfection has never been achieved, but we're working on it, okay? Now, what this, this, this joint declaration was a scheme by the Roman Catholic Church and by the apostates within the, the Lutheran Church to pretend that the controversy that existed between Martin Luther and the Roman Catholic Church were all of a sudden discovered to be misunderstandings, just unfortunate misunderstandings. And that Martin Luther's rebellion against the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church was all a consequence of that misunderstanding. Misunderstandings. So that there... to, so, sorry, sorry that I have to interrupt you here. Misunderstandings. Doesn't that remind you of what I said in the beginning? That there were a few mistakes, misunderstandings by the Belgians when they went into Congo. 
by the Roman Catholic Church when it went into the Inquisition and martyred millions and millions of saints. Misunderstanding, isn't that what they always come up with throughout the history? Well, absolutely. Rome, Rome covers up all of her sins by the word misunderstanding. Okay? How many misunderstandings do they have to profess before we realize what understanding really is? Okay, so they're pretending that there's literally no more division between the Roman Catholic Church and that church that is named after Martin Luther. It, it gives the, the, the global public and perception that the Protestant Reformation was wrong. That's what everyone was to take from this joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. Now, Martin Luther disagreed with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church says you're only justified if the papacy justifies you, if the Roman Catholic Church justifies you. And that only happens if, number one, you're baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, you participate in all the sacraments, you eat the Jesus cookie, you confess all your sins to a priest, you worship Mary and all the saints, you participate in the... the, the, uh, the uh, uh, the grace of the saints, you receive grace from the saints and Mary and Jesus and everybody else. That is, you receive spiritual merit from the overflow of the faithfulness and grace and mercy of the saints. That's why they're so dependent upon the dead, because they receive merit from them in the Roman Catholic Church. It the joint declaration of justification was Rome seemingly conceded that the Lutherans were correct, that Martin Luther was correct, that there really was no division between the Roman Catholic Church and Martin Luther to begin with. Now, how can that possibly be? When the gospel preached in the Bible says you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and to God only be the glory. But they made it all seem that the Protestant Reformation was just a simple mistake. And now, with that basis, they're going to lead all the Protestant churches right back to the Roman Catholic Church where they were born. The, the term harlot daughters mean anything to you? And that's what's taking place right before your very eyes. All of this ecumenical malarkey is straight from the pit of Rome. We have no fellowship with Rome any more than Christ has fellowship with Antichrist. Let me say it again. We have no fellowship with the Roman Catholic Church or the papacy or any of their false doctrines, any of their false miracles, any of their false religiosity, any of their paganism, any of their blasphemies, any of their nonsensical baloney any more than we have fellowship with Satan himself. And we're all led to believe that there was a joint declaration of the doctrine of justification between the Lutheran Church and the Roman Catholic Church. It's all smoke and mirrors. There's no more joint unity between the Protestant, the true Bible-believing Christianity with the Roman Catholic Church than there is with light and darkness. But the whole world is taught to believe a lie. And that the only rightful thing for the Protestant churches to do is to repent of their Protestantism and come home to Mother Church. And slowly but surely, like a toad being boiled in a, in, in a pot, they're making us all Roman Catholic in our beliefs. And the first lesson to be learned in that endeavor is futurism. That the Antichrist is not revealed, not like Paul said, revealed before Christ returns, we're taught that the Antichrist is future, way off in the distant future. He won't be revealed until first Jesus comes. 
So we really don't have to worry about the Antichrist then, do we? And that's what makes this unity with the papacy possible. Do you see now how you've been destroyed? Do you see now how you've been deceived? Do you see now how you've been betrayed? Your life's blood, your everlasting life has been threatened by your Protestant and evangelical pastor because he didn't tell you these things. What do you owe him? What do you owe him but your undying wrath? And that's exactly what they're going to receive when Christ returns. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. But what should you be doing in the meantime? Listening to the truth. The merciful truth. We're going to tell you who the Antichrist is. And when we're done telling you who the Antichrist is, nobody will ever be able to deceive you again. And you'll be able to spot a liar a mile away. You'll be able to spot God's people a mile away. And you won't be tempted to anymore to believe a lie. But right now, that's what your churches are all about. That's what your pastors are all about. Lies. Deception. Damnable lies and deceptions. And I mean what I say when I say damnable lies. If you believe what they say, you're going to be damned because you're going to be found when Christ returns, worshiping and obeying a false Christ. That's what futurism is all about. That's why they created it. Do you comprehend what I'm telling you? Do you have any questions? I'll answer as many questions as you can pose. Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. So, whereas the article continues, in the middle of February 2000, that must be, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat met with Antichrist Pope John Paul II at the Vatican to sign an agreement regarding the future of Jerusalem that warned Israel against any unilateral decision affecting Jerusalem. And, whereas, Bob Jones University has been unjustly slandered for anti-Catholic bias by Senators McCain, Torricelli, Hollings, and the liberal mass media, and whereas the House of Representatives of the United States Congress has just appointed a Roman Catholic priest as its chaplain for the first time, March 23, 2000. And Tom, as far as I know today, um, that is even a Jesuit, if I'm correctly That's right. informed. That's right. Best I can recall, uh, the last one, the chaplain over the Congress, was a Jesuit priest. Back to you. Yeah. And whereas Pope John Paul II has declared the year 2000 a quote unquote great jubilee year for Roman Catholics that establishes the restoration of indulgences, the very issue that prompted Martin Luther to draft the 95 Theses in October of 1517. Papal spokesman Timothy Chagru states, quote, the indulgence is one of the spiritual privileges extended during Jubilee. It is a way of applying the merits of the good deeds of the saints and the Virgin Mary and Christ himself to the rest of us. Unquote. I think if I give Tom the mic now on this sentence alone, he can uh, go along for two and a half hours, right? Well, I'll spare the listeners this time. <laughs> I, I just, uh, it, it's just amazing to me. I, I hope the listeners have been listening to everything up to this point. They can preach their own sermons. 
I would just uh, suggest to the people reading and, and listening to this uh, that for once they uh, look up the 95 Thesis Martin Luther um, published in uh, 1517 and read those theses to understand what the point actually really was. Uh, Martin Luther in 1517 when he allegedly nailed the uh, thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, which is, by the way, not historically proven. It is proven that he published them. They were printed on leaflets in Latin first and spread all over the place where he lived there in Eisenach and, um, uh, and, and the city in Germany. I don't come to the name right now. Wittenberg, uh, Wittenberg, where he was professor in the university there. And because of the great interest these little leaflets got, they were translated in a hurry in German and then spread all, all over the country. But in these 95 theses, Martin Luther did not, did not denounce the papacy being the Antichrist. Nothing of the sort. But he just proved biblically that the selling of indulgences is devilish work and doesn't give any merit to anyone and that you are not saved by buying indulgences, buying yourself into heaven. What did Jesus Christ say? Rather, a camel goes through the eye of a needle than a rich man comes into heaven, right? And there are so many different explanations of what he meant by the eye of the needle that I don't even go into that. But I think his picture words speak for themselves that you can understand that whatever eye of needle is it is something very small and the camel is something very big it just won't fit so the possibility that a rich man goes to heaven is quite small that's what he meant but in the roman catholic church you have to be rich to buy indulgences to go into heaven so when you have no money you're damned that's what they teach the church who loves all the people, loves them so much they kill just millions and millions and millions of them through the ages. So when Tom doesn't rant, then I do. <laughs> Therefore, the article continues. The South Atlantic Presbytery of the Bible Presbyterian Church at its spring meeting in the Bible Presbyterian Church of Charlotte, North Carolina, March 25, 2000, resolves and warns the Roman Catholic Church, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, as stated in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, constitutes the greatest threat to fundamental Christianity in the 21st century. Now, I would love to continue, but I can't. Because this last few word, these last few words of this sentence are of so great importance. The Roman Catholic Church, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, constitutes the greatest threat to fundamental Christianity in the 21st century. Now, if you remember that little movie that I'm a movie, that little movie, that Hour of the Truth broadcast I did some years ago. On uh, Georgetown University, you remember that I played a little clip from a uh, guy, I, don't, I think he was military, he was an ex-marine or something, and he said that fundamental Christians are the ones that have to be exterminated. They see them as a danger. Fundamentalism, the word fundamentalism, and I think that is something that Tom also wants to explain a little about. He can probably do that a little bit better than I can. The word fundamentalism has a very bad uh, tone in the days we live in today. Like the word conspiracy has a very bad tone today. Even the Bible speaks in Psalms and other places about conspiracies all over. But fundamental has a very, very bad tone today. Uh, is tone the right word, Tom? I, I think there's another word. Um, well, the impression the impression that one automatically gets from the word fundamentalism is 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 uh, horror, is terror. Yeah, of because, course, uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalism uh, is uh, uh, connected with that, especially since 9/11, uh, 
and uh, not only the Americans, but the whole world is indoctrinated with 19 uh, bath towel wearing camel jockeys uh, getting uh, to implode uh, two very big buildings in the city of New York. Uh, those were fundamental Islamists. So fundamentalism has a very bad tone in the world today. That is a very bad shame because the Roman Catholic Church is everything that fundamentalism stands for. But the problem is that the fundamentalism that the Roman Catholic Church is built on is the wrong fundamentalism. The true fundamentalism is biblical fundamentalism. Fun oh, hold your horses here, Jörg. Biblical fundamentalism. Because that means that you agree with the teachings of the Bible and you do not make one little compromise. You are standing firm on the fundament the Bible provides to you. The Bible, the Word of God, Jesus Christ is the rock. That's the fundament that you are standing on. And when you are standing on that foundation, you are a fundamental protestant. And by that, you are worthy of being killed by the Roman Catholic Church. What's that about it, Tom? Yes, that's exactly what it's about. Everything that's happened in uh, international uh, uh International history has been geared toward uh, likening Bible-believing Christians with, say, radical fundamentalist Islamists. Okay, oh, I mean, I mean, it looks like you know we're we're the we're the great fundamentalist uh, extremists of the world. We're the ones who say that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus Christ is the Savior. <clears throat> we they they call that radical fundamentalism. They call that domestic terror now. They've likened us with with uh, the radical Islamist fundamentalists who strap bombs on their bodies and walk into synagogues or walk into buses or schools. That's how we've been characterized for the last fifty years. And the mainstream media has been principally behind it all, just as has our government. And who's behind it, ultimately? The Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. The inquisitions have never ended, okay? Rome still kills the saints. Rome is still drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. I just want you to know where that threat comes from today. I mean, it's easy to tell you about the old Spanish Inquisition, but what if some, what, why hasn't your pastor told you that it all of a sudden became, at the end of the Spanish Inquisition, it became unpopular to kill God's people? So they had to disguise the Inquisition. It had to take on a completely different form so that no one could recognize it. And do you know what it became? It became World War One. You nobody's ever told you that World War One was a Roman Catholic Inquisition against spiritual opponents. And who are the spiritual opponents of the Roman Catholic Church? Bible believing Christians who know who the Antichrist is. And everyone and who is not tridentine in his belief and action for the Roman Catholic Church, Tom. That's right. Anyone Liberal Catholics, for example. That's why, uh, and I think that is an important point you, you maybe have to make uh, once again. That's why the Liberal Catholics in America in, are in great danger too. Because okay. they love the Protestant achievements of freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, quote unquote. They love that and they are in great peril. Because the real Roman Catholic Church is the Tridentine Roman Catholic Church that makes no compromises. Sound familiar about the compromises, what I just said? 
Right. They are the ones who hold to the Council of Trent, the Jesuit-inspired, the Jesuit-led, the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent. They're called Tridentine Roman Catholics. And they are the extreme right wing of the Roman Catholic Church. And they're the ones who demonize God's people. I mean, you can't get the world to kill God's people unless you first demonize them. And likening us to uh, Islamic extremists, fundamentalists, is the very purpose of ultimately killing God's people. They are first demonizing us. <clears throat> and uh, so we know what their goal is. And when persecution comes to the house of God, it's going to come from the king of our country. It's going to come from our government. They do the bidding of the papacy. Okay? We are enemies of the state. We are domestic terrorists. That's what they claim us to be. That's what they've indoctrinated the whole world to see us as. Domestic terrorists, radical fundamentalists, because we say there's no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved than Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's no flexibility. There's no compromise. We know the truth, and we don't compromise. That's the body of Christ. That's why we've always been slain. The Bible says those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And why do we suffer persecution? Because we hold to the so-called radical fundamentalist precept that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Muhammad was a false prophet. There's no salvation in the Muslim church like there's no salvation in the Roman Catholic Church because the God of the Roman Catholic Church is Satan himself and his vicar, the papacy, the Pope of Rome. Now, we don't wage physical warfare against anyone. We just get the microphone, we write the books, we talk to people till we're blue in the face, beating our heads against the wall, trying to teach people what cannot be denied, what is instantly recognizable to someone who has not been indoctrinated with the propaganda, the papal propaganda that pervades every avenue of, of discussion in this world. Restoring true biblical Christianity. Restoring the kingdom of Christ. That's what we're all about. We don't shed anybody's blood. We're forbidden to. Our God said, thou shalt not kill. We are a threat to no one. We rely upon the wooing, the incessant wooing of the Holy Spirit and the written word of God, the testimony of the saints, Bible prophecy, the grace and mercy of an, of, of, of an ever-loving God, a benevolent, a benevolent King of kings and Lord of lords that wants nothing but salvation for mankind. Those who would receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. It's a merciful religion. It's a peace-loving religion. It's a sacrificial religion lit religion. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what we do. That's who we are. Now, I raise my voice because I want to be heard. I express passion. I can't speak in dispassionate terms or a dispassionate tone about something so vitally important in the lives of every living creature. But I seek no vengeance. I seek no blood. I seek no weapons. I seek only the truth. Radical fundamentalist. Just because I say there's no other name given among men whereby you must be saved, But the Roman Catholic Church is drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. 
she calls herself unashamedly calls herself the church militant. Does that sound like the body of Christ to you? Back to you, Yerk. Tom, before we come to an end, uh, I, of course, have to read uh, this last sentence here to the end. Uh, I want to read something out of the Bible that makes it very clear with what is the distinction between the war of the saints and the war of the Roman Catholic Church against the saints. The Roman Catholic Church uses a material sword to kill and shed the blood of the martyrs and the saints of Jesus Christ. But the Bible tells us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The Roman Catholic Church only wrestles against flesh and blood. There you have a wonderful, great distinction between Bible-believing Christians on the one hand, who live according to this word, and Roman Catholics who ignore the word and go out against physical war, against flesh and blood. I don't even read the rest because putting the whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, is a wonderful place. But it's about these few words. We, Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-following Christians, that's why we are called Christians, because we follow Christ, wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we know that our fight is spiritually, because we fight against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And what higher place is there but the one who pronounces himself to be the highest of high in this world, the Pope, the quote-unquote vicar of Christ? Any comment on this, Tom, before we continue for the last few sentences in this paper here? No, oh, I, uh, I think by now the listeners should be getting the idea. <laughs> uh, so they, know, they know now who the Antichrist is. And if they go away from this broadcast not knowing who the Antichrist is, then they either were not paying attention or the deception is greater than even I estimated. Look, nothing speaks louder than the fact that God sent his only begotten son to die to redeem us from our sins. Now, who in his right mind would think that that sacrificing God who sacrificed his own son for our redemption would leave us in jeopardy of not knowing who the Antichrist is? If there's anything at all that would convince you of the truth, that is it. Why would he leave us in jeopardy of falling prey to the deceptions of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy after he had sent his own son to bleed and die to redeem us from him? Makes no sense at all. So if you are maintain the belief that we're not supposed to know who the Antichrist is or that we can't know who the Antichrist is or that it shouldn't even be a concern of Christians today, then you believed a lie, a damnable lie. That's the truth. And it's not hate speech to tell you that. It's sacrificial love to tell you that. 
because to tell you that, I receive the wrath of all who love and believeth a lie. It's costly to tell the truth. It's costly in more ways than I'll even tell you. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, you probably remember what Eric Arthur Blair, also better known as George Orwell, said about speaking the truth, right? Uh, they say that he can be quoted by saying, speaking the truth in a universe of lies is a um, revolutionary act. This is not yeah. a word by word quote, but that's the gist of what he said. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus himself said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And Tertullian said the first reaction to truth is hate. The same yeah. Tertullian that wrote that prayer that we were speaking of, uh, that I was reading in the beginning, that was recorded here by Henry Gretton Guinness in his wonderful work, Romanism and the Reformation, that you read. Yeah. 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 And I've experienced all that hate. I've experienced it by the people who are closest to me. All the people who are most important to me. All the people that I love the most, all the people that I would sacrifice myself the most for, I've experienced that hate because I told them the truth. Back to you. I'm just going to finish the last few sentences of this uh, resolution that was given by the uh, South Atlantic Presbytery of the Bible Presbyterian Church meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, March 25th, 2000. It continues to say, after what, I, uh, what we just expressly uh, mentioned, the Roman Catholic Church has long since forsaken the Bible alone, grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. There should be no confraternity with this apostate church in ministerial associations, community Easter sunrise services, thanksgiving services, mass evangelism, or common social endeavors. We admonish devout believers to lovingly and firmly win Roman Catholics to Christ and urge new converts to obey Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, where it says, And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. I enjoyed this broadcast very much, and as you all see, of course, we still have only about uh, one minute. There are many, many quotes to come. And this is something that we will address in our next meeting. And I want to give Tom the ending comment for the broadcast today because he so wonderfully started it also. Thank you for watching and listening. And please, after this is done, turn to your Bible, read and study your Bible, preferably the AV 1611 King James Bible, and make yourself known with what the Bible says about being the Antichrist and read it without church glasses on and come back next week to our next broadcast. Until then, I see you. Maranatha. Now, I just want to emphasize once again what I emphasized at the beginning of the broadcast. The purpose of this broadcast was to ensure that you have the knowledge, the means to identify infallibly who the Antichrist is, and to know that Christians, Bible-believing Christians, all throughout history, all the way back to the first century Christians, they knew who the Antichrist was just as much as you do now. And they denounced him all throughout the Christian era. Now you must ask yourself the vital question. Why does no one today know for a certainty who the Antichrist is? Why don't they denounce the papal Antichrist in the churches today? Why do not they identify positively 
historically and scripturally and pro- and prophetically who the Antichrist is so that no one can be deceived. Why are we in our generation so ignorant of this vital, basic, elemental truth? And what does that do with your relationship with God to know that he sent his only begotten son to die for you, to save you from your sins, to give you everlasting life, and then leave you in jeopardy of not knowing who the Antichrist is so that you can be deceived by him and ruin everything that Christ did for you. Ask yourself that question. That's the question you must ask. Why have you been left ignorant of the basic elemental truth of Christianity. Think about it long and hard. I'll see you next week. Same faith we live today.